quiero decir que eh, el día de hoy se cumple el sueño de tener al maestro Kiarostami en Morelia. Es un sueño que tuvimos desde hace 10 años, desde que empezamos el festival. Fue una ilusión tremenda siempre tenerlo aquí. Y quiero agradecer muy especialmente a Pepe Scarlett que está con nosotros y a Nazi, Nazi Scarlett que está con nosotros porque si ustedes no hubiera sido posible la realización de este sueño, muchas gracias a ustedes. Y quiero también agradecer a Jeff, que es un amigo que está desde el primer año en el festival de Morelia, que ha sido un gran amigo del festival y que además es el, bueno, el más extraordinario conocedor de la obra de Marta Piarostano. Y, y para nosotros es simplemente decirles que estamos realmente muy emocionados de poder aprender tanto de uno de los artistas más importantes en el cine. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. Muchas gracias, maestro. Gracias. I went to a fine art school in painting. 
That's a very important answer. My four-year course took 13 years to complete. At that very period, I turned to filmmaking, not filmmaking itself, but around filmmaking, making posters for films and title sequences, and advertising films. Which I believe was the best training for learning filmmaking. And in any event, without realizing it, at once I realized I, I found myself making children's films. And I would have never conceived that filmmaking would become a serious and official profession for me. And even today, filmmaking is only a part of my professional life. Yes, uh, Abbas is also a, a superb photographer and a very fine and trained poet. Um, and I think he's a little modest about his paintings. I've only seen two of them in running reproduction, but I think they're great. Um, you mentioned that you went in first to make films for children, and I suppose partly about children. What do you think you learned from that experience of working with children for so many years? It was a very particular kind of period. I worked for about 20 years on films for children. Well, I was a non-professional. I hadn't studied cinema. And naturally, I was working with children, none of whom were professionals. And therefore, this assemblage, putting the composition of myself and these non-professional children, both of us non-professionals, produced a cinema that continues to today. What I learned from those children in a short session like today's it would not be possible for me to articulate it. More than anything else, and just to bridge in a simple sentence, I learned how to live during the period that I worked with those children. How they don't think about tomorrow nor yesterday, and how they know the full value of the moment. In truth, there are these tiny philosophers that are around us and that we don't take seriously. Uh, so afterwards, in the last 10, ten years, now 13 years, during which I have not been working with them, but in my work, I always continue to try to keep in mind their perspective and their point of view. I always, behind the camera, I wonder if there was a child, and I try to retain their gaze and their philosophy of living when I'm making films and when I'm writing. Okay, um, I think it's uh, timely now, especially as we mentioned point of view, uh, to go on to the first clip. Now this is from the film Close Up. It's made sometime after I stopped making films with uh, with children, and 
It's a fascinating film. Uh, it might be called a documentary or it might not. It's about um, the prosecution of uh, a man for fraud. Uh, the man had contacted, well, I won't say he would co he contacted family. You, you will see actually what, what may have happened uh, in the clip. But he, he was being prosecuted by the family, really, for fraud because he told them that, or allowed them to believe that he was Morrison Mahmoud a famous Iranian filmmaker. And uh, we're just going to show a brief clip from this. Actually, the, the clips usually last about four minutes because you need a little bit of time with Alice's films to really get the flavor of them. So uh, could we have the first clip from the close-up, please?
ولی به علت مشکلی پدرم ایشون موفق نشد انجام بستش و دستش So um, we 
went there in front of the prison and I had my first encounter with this person who had been arrested as someone who had done something wrong. Um, but if you were to see the film, and that's the first thing we shot, but if you were to see the film after that, I had just no idea what exactly it is I was going to do. In, in very brief order, there were two groups. A, a group of people who had been fooled, tricked, and then an individual who had tricked them. And it was very difficult to... Um, it was very difficult to keep them and persuade them to be in front of my camera and to play out their own negative roles once again. The shooting lasted 40 days and you might not believe this, I did not sleep for 40 nights. Because each night I thought, I'm sure they won't agree to come back in front of the camera and play out these negative roles of their own selves. And each day when I rang the doorbell and they opened the door to me, it was as if the door of paradise had been opened onto me. And I would think, oh, I have one more day to continue making this. I wish you had seen the film, in which case my explanations would perhaps make more sense to you. Um, but you haven't, and I have to read my answers because I'm sure Jeff has some other plans as well. So, um, once again, I just want to emphasize that now, looking back, it makes complete sense to me that this film occupies a position as a, in the transition between my films made for children and films made for adults, in that it allowed all of these characters to replay a part of their own childhood. Otherwise, as Ford would say, no one is willing to show their dirty underwear to the world. And just to wrap up and precisely answer your question, I would have to say that um, this is a documentary that has been very precisely and were you to ask me what is a documentary, I would say it's a good film. <laughs> and if you ask me what is a good film, I would say it's a film that seems like it's a documentary. <laughs> Were I to abridge it further, even, I would say there is only one film. Good film is a film whose backdrop is reality. And this is only the starting point. one that would reveal other things, that would reveal our own hidden truths to us. Uh, <coughs> I 
think it probably is going to be possible for you to find a copy of this from somewhere, and I hope you will see it, because for many years, if anyone asks me, what is the best film you've made, I would say it's Kozak. Because I did not make it. <laughs> because the characters, just like children, were daring and they were strong and they would um, impose their wishes and their force onto me as their director. So for many years, until I make another film that now if I'm asked my name, I would always say this was the best film I made once again, not because of what I did, because the film is based on the strength of the player. Um, you mentioned that a good film is one which has a backdrop of reality, and in fact, I think in another interview we did some time ago, you said that one of the way, ways to get to the truth is through telling lies. This leads us into um, the next clip, which is from a film called Taste of Cherry. Um, Taste of Cherry won the Palm Door in the Cannes Film Festival, and uh, it's an extraordinary film. I think uh, you know when Cam gave the film Andor, it was as if the world had Abbas had won many prizes by then, but it really brought international attention to an extraordinary body of work. Taste of Cherry concerns a man who is driving around trying to get somebody to drive. To, well, he, he drives around trying to find somebody to do something for him. It's never made very clear what that is for a very long time. All Alice's films are about mystery and ambiguity. That's one of the reasons they're so uh, amazing. But actually, um, at this stage, perhaps, since the film played last night, I should be able to uh, offer a spoiler in that we find out that eventually he wants to die. And he wants somebody to help him die. And that's uh, the situation that you will see in this clip from Tracy Cherry. Could we have clip number two, please?
بعضی کارها گفتنش از انجام دادنش مشکل کرد من گفتم بادم به خاطر این بچه نبود همون کار انجام نمیدادم در از من مشکل قبول بودم این پول شما رو میپوشونم متوقع دارم تا آخر میشی حالا چه ها سری بگیرم بچه ها بگیرم بگیرم این کار سرباتی بچه هم اگر بابا رو تمام بگیرم خیلی میشم خیلی باشی برش حالا این کلو برم بعد بچه هم برسن شما سرکت کشید من کار کرسی خیلی هم من پس برد
But when he said, I would be glad to, I saw no gladness in his face. <laughs> There is no change in his face whatsoever. And I said, okay, let's uh, move over and chat. And we did for a little while, and I could tell he was exactly the same person. And the second character that you saw in the film, he too didn't recognize me in any way as a director. And uh, when I presented him with the screenplay, he never read it. I would read it to him and he would listen. I think he was illiterate or had very little education. And he would say, you read it. And in certain spots where he disagreed with the screenplay, with the dialogue, he would say, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> he had his own reasons, the reasons why he didn't want to say the ones. I'd written a sentence in the screenplay about divorce, a divorce between man and woman. He turned silent in that instance. In the evening when he was leaving, he said, what was your name? I told him my name and I could see that he memorized it, didn't know who I was. As I was saying, I found him in the countryside. But the following day when he returned, he had no information on me. And in his very particular accent, Turkish accent, he said to me, you're an important guy. <laughs> Because my daughter told me that foreign radios have spoken about you. <laughs> and the reason he considered that I was an important person was that foreign radios had mentioned my name. And his whole argument was, you were an important person. Why would you bring the word divorce into your screenplay? And I was just dumbstruck. There's no one else. It's just him and I in the middle of the countryside. And I tore up three pages of my screenplay. I said, you're right. And and when I say that this is the continuation of my work with children, this is why. Because with children, they will not accept to play something that is that play something properly. It's not to say they won't do it, but they won't do it well. And none of the characters in my films accept me as an overlord or as having greater power than them. <laughs> Whereas with the professionals with whom I've worked twice, they definitely um, take into consideration professionally the laws of cinema and consider their director to be God and accept what he says and do.
But wasn't it the case that when you were filming these scenes, if you were in the car talking with them? My introduction was so long that I forgot the question, but with this introduction, I can better answer your question. The two characters you saw in this film never met in the course of the shooting of this film. I was always sitting on one side or the other of the car, at times as the passenger, at times as the driver who is going to kill himself. So I would be speaking their dialogues, face, facing them. So much so that when um, the shooting was finished and when we invited the actors to come um, and this man had come to watch the screening, that his first sentence when he came out of the screening was, he didn't look like that when we were making the film. It turned out looking like that. Because <laughs> he'd never seen the other person. He'd never seen the other actor. That was the only solution I had to have the two of them face each other. Now I'm bolder. At that time, I wasn't so bold. <laughs> At that time, I wouldn't have dared. I still wished to maintain a certain amount of control over them. Now, I allow them greater freedom and certain um, things occur that if I did not give them that freedom would not occur. Just uh, one final point to wrap this uh, discussion up. All of my actors are good, but what I owe the quality of their acting to is the freedom that they are given. Uh, that leads us nicely to the next clip uh, because the actors um, in this particular sequence are uh, Abbas and Sephora, uh, who worked with Abbas on ABC Africa. Uh, Sephora is sitting in the audience today and um, uh, he'd be interested to see his performance here. Um, did you want to say something before? I just wondered if there might be this one question in the minds of our audience and if you might allow me to pose that before we move to the cooking. Just one question. A uh, question that emerges from the discussion we just had. Yes, the audience has a question. Um, yes, okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Creo que entiendo por qué él eh, estuvo en la escena y no los dos actores que no son actores. Y fue por eso, o sea, que participó él en la escena dando los diálogos porque no eran actores reales y 
al encontrarse los dos no actores, no iba a fluir de la misma manera que él quería la escena. ¿Se entiende? ¿Y está activado? Sí, bueno, pues, chose to Therefore, no, I believe that if I left them free, I would not have been able to obtain the results I was after. At the time, we were working with a 35 millimeter camera. It was very um, soon after the revolution, and obtaining negative uh, film was very difficult. It was a very, uh, we had great limitation placed on film stock and how much we had access to. The film was made with less than 80 reels of 40 feet. 400 feet. <laughs> Therefore, I had to exert a certain amount of control on the situation. Thank you. And because digital technology made that uh, slightly different, but you can shoot much more. So we're going back to my plan now, which is to show uh, ABC Africa, the clip, uh, which was made digitally. It's a documentary, uh, by the way, which have us made an invitation of UNESCO, I think, uh, to, to make a documentary about the plight of orphans, uh, children orphaned by AIDS in Uganda. So if we could have the clip now, please. Thank you. 
that there's a tree outside that window because trees are very important for us. Um, could you talk a little bit about the important the importance of what you don't show? Because that is, is an, a very important element of your work, I think. You talk about my courage, but had I known that as a clip you were going to choose four minutes of darkness for the audience here, I might have completely lost my courage. <laughs> But thankfully, you have the opportunity to see this film, and uh, these uh, minutes will take on a meaning in the context of a 90-minute documentary. So as I said, um, our time here is short, so we don't have time to go into the subject of documentary, but we shall agree to that term for the film. I just want to say that we were going to shoot this film in 35, and the exploratory trip that my colleague and I, Sekula Samadiana and I, took to Africa, we took a couple of digital cameras to basically take visual notes for the film. Once we returned um, to Tehran and watched the uh, rushes, we realized that there was no way that with a um, the team, a larger team and big equipment, we would ever be able to get the footage, the images that we had on the digital cameras. So the courage really was in that we decided to use those images and edit them and present them. The force and strength of those images surpassed anything that uh, greater preparation could have produced. And when the Cannes Film Festival did for the first time accept this film into its official section, it was a confirmation of the fact that there is, at times, this kind of filmmaking can produce results and uh, pictures that cannot be surpassed by any other kind of filmmaking. Therefore, each of these films in my filmography taught me something and led to the next film. So if my filmmaking is what it is, it is the product of what cinema itself taught me, not a product of anything within me, myself. And you went on to make several more films with digital uh, uh, technology where you sort of try to minimize uh, your, your role as the director in, in 10 and 5. And you were almost sort of doing that in ABC Africa. But the reason I chose this clip uh, was because I wanted to talk to you about 
the way you want the audience to respond to your films by, with their imaginations. You, you, you don't give them everything. In this, in this instance, you didn't give them anything to look at really, until the trip. Um, I pointed to something which was 80 reels of film, which was the minimum that we needed to make Taste of Church. Filmmakers would know that with that quantity of um, negative film, film stock, you can't, almost can't make a film. So, for each of your shots, you really only allow three takes. Uh, so digital filmmaking allowed me relief from the worry of the shortage of film stock, um, damage to the film in the lab, and um, and allowed and, and the film being ruined, um, and allowed me the freedom to just not worry about those things and make the film that I wanted. To. And this, as I said, was the influence of films on me. The quantity of rushes that Mr. Sanandian and I brought back we could have made three ABC Africa's out of it. And for me, this was a liberating event. Well, for, the, for our final clip, we're going back to one of the, your more recent films, which wasn't shot on digital, uh, certified copy, copy on form. Um, it's a film about um, uh, an antique shop owner uh, in, in uh, Tuscany, and her encounter with uh, an English writer who's writing a book on copies and originals and things. And the film is really, I suppose, partly about their relationship, uh, which I must say, after watching, the more times I've watched this film, I think I've watched it five times now, the less certain I am about their relationship, what it is. Um, this is a brief clip from, so, as I say, it's, it's on the
the woman actor on the one part and the, the male actor in another shot. Another way in which the film does not differ from my previous work is that once again in this film I have set a professional next to a non-professional. The man was not a professional actor, this was his first time in front of a camera and Juliet obviously needs no introduction. خب دیگه از این تفاوتایی که در هر فیلم شخصیتایی که انتخاب میشن به فیلم تحمل میکنن و بدونی که چه تفاوتی داره فیلم در خارج از اینا بشه. Putting aside the difference that's born of the characters of each film and how that defines the difference between films, now we might examine what difference it makes to have made the film abroad. به اشتباه فیلمایی که میبینیم Based on the films we see, this and the following one, shot in Japan, which we always conceive of as somewhere so far away and so different, the proof of it is that it's not very different. It doesn't matter where you're shooting, the basic element, the human individuals involved, are working with happiness and sadness, and that ends up being the principal component alongside filmmaking equipment, the basics of film, theater, art, and so ultimately it doesn't matter whether you're making a film in one country or another. <laughs> Our basic material is human beings and human issues. In the same way that for a sculptor, wood or bronze or um, another alloy might be the material for making their statues, Looking at the two films we just saw, the two film clips we just saw, ABC Africa and um, Certified Copy, Copy Perform, um, it's a filmmaker working with two different types of material. In one I was working with wood, in another one I was working with bronze. And uh, I just want to ask one more question because it seems to me that your body of work is one of the most personal bodies of work in cinema today. It's very distinctive, it's quite idiosyncratic. And it seems to me that uh, the films come out of your personal experience. Is that something you would agree with? Comment on that. Not, they don't come across exactly as they happened, 
But none of my works have been based on any novels or fiction or any other films. All of them have been drawn from my own personal experiences. You might have a chance to see certified copy this evening, and I just want to put this out there that I actually am both Juliet and William, and even the child in the film. All of these are a part of my own experience. And all the other projects in film, each of those are parts of my own self. Okay, we're now going to throw the session open to you, the audience. I think there are microphones. Uh, if you're um, asking in uh, questions in Spanish, then we will have to uh, listen to the translation, so please give us some time. Or please feel free to ask questions in English as well. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Por acá. Yo quisiera preguntarle respecto a prejuicio occidental en torno al mundo de, de al mundo árabe, al mundo iraquí. ¿Cómo entra, cómo enfrenta el público de su propio país su cinematografía con respecto a lo que ha encontrado respecto a la respuesta europea que ha sido la de muchos premios y la de un gran respeto por su filmografía ¿Cómo, cómo se recibe en su propio país su propio cine y qué tanto ha encontrado de este aparente choque de civilizaciones o de mentalidades a su cine ¿no? ¿Cómo ve estas dos visiones del mundo y qué tanto usted pertenece a estos dos mundos, al mundo occidental y al mundo árabe? ¿Y qué tanto es importante? Uh, the question is uh, about the relationship between uh, Atlas's work, which has been really very well received in, in the West, but how, how is it received in uh, Iran? Uh, first, um, It's also asking about the, how the Middle East is perceived in, by the West, and whether or not Abbas feels he belongs more to the West or Europe. There were five or six questions there, and it's quite complex. I'll have to parse them one by one and attempt to answer. I'll start with the last one because it's closest to my memory. When you're asking where I belong. As a filmmaker, where I belong, where my feet are, where I live is the place I grew up and where I was born in Iran. Um, I made a mistake when I said as a filmmaker. I meant as a citizen. But as a filmmaker, I have no right to look down at where my feet are, at where my roots are. I have to look around me. And the West is a part of that. I don't limit myself to my own culture, my own nationality, or my own religion. This is our profession. How can I have a community of interlocutors when my gaze is fixed on my own feet and on my own roots? This doesn't apply to me only as a filmmaker. This is also how anyone in the audience watches. Um, 
Films from the West arrived in Iran at the time and are subtitled, perhaps not officially, and are watched voraciously because everyone wants to know what is going on elsewhere. And with regards to the other aspect of the question, there is many um, naval gazing and radical views that the West has regarding the East. The notion that they might they must still educate the East and the fact that they don't take seriously enough the values of the East. But I think we can pass on this particular point of discussion. Gracias. Yes, we have a question. I'm sorry. 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 Take this great uh, opportunity, Olivia, uh, to ask a question that I always wanted to ask about my favorite film of yours, which is A Taste of Sherry. Uh, I think uh, at the end of the movie there is a three or four minute coda where we see the we see you and your team uh, behind the scenes, and uh, I think it's a great ending. But I also think that the movie could end perfectly without it. So I always been intrigued by this. Why did you decide to like, show that uh, movie is an illusion or something like that? Thank you. Um, <coughs> As you can go, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that I'm not sure. First of all, the fact that I have a difference of opinion with my um, viewer doesn't make me at all happy. But I think that you're going to so in some ways I think sometimes that perhaps these kinds of encounters with their own viewers doesn't help directors. But I really respect the view of each of my audience members and I believe that each person draws away from the film within their notions and their capabilities, what they need. So, my answer is not an imposition on your view, it's just the answer of another viewer, that would be me, my name is Mr. Kiarostan, um, that's watching the film. Um, you'll forgive it if it's a slightly radical reply. I'll put it this way, that if the film were not to end in the way it does, I doubt I would have dared um, distribute it, have it come out onto the screens. And I'll explain why. As you saw in the film, I in no way address the issues of the problems of a particular individual. And I didn't allow you to develop an emotional relationship with the character and empathize with him. He's just one of the individuals that any given day on earth says good night and goes to sleep with the sleeping pills. I did a lot of research on these people at that time. I'm not entirely sure that this is an accurate figure, but it was an earth shattering figure. Something like 100,000 people attempt suicide. 
And about a thousand of them die, and the rest remain. Fin fin de los tiempos, el mundo falta ni con el llamado para su amor, con 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 This was what I attempted to say, what the film attempted to say, that after years of the world still goes on. This wasn't about Mr. Betty's issues. It's about life continuing, life going on. The film was making in the year in Tehobe, the Japanese. The film was trying to say life is a choice. It's not an imposition. I guess you want to do what in Kanata would be. Like the last that the the and the and the and the and the and and the and and that if, given the fact that suicide is an option, you've chosen to live, or you're living, that means you've made a choice to live. If you only as you are on, the the as you are on, the you are It was a phrase by Siorank. That was my motivation when I began my inspiration to make this film. Without possibility of suicide, I would have killed myself long ago. But I mean, in Kano Kurushi, this is the death of Kurushi, Charan, Midas Boss. But I mean, in film, the film is the death of Kurushi, was the youngest daughter, then the young man. The possibility of suicide is like an exit, which I can see we have an exit here. And what this film tried to express was that if you don't have the talent for living, the exit is there. You can always take it. Right, right here, one of our viewers chose to take the exit. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the way life is, and suicide is a phenomenon that breeds freedom. And God, it's said that God created men, humans, as free due to the two options he gave them. One of them, I can state what it is, suicide, and the other one, I'm not going to say. <coughs> you can guess what it is. Next question, please. My question is, what is the motivation, y las decisiones más importantes en estas obras. The question was about the uh, motivation behind the films 5 and 10, which are digital works. I remember earlier. Um, they're sort of minimalist works, but very, very rich in many ways. As I said, I wanted to become a painter, but it didn't end up being one. I still carry that as a chip on my shoulders. I compensate in part through photography. And another part is compensated for the digital camera gave me this possibility, not of painting, but of creating something that falls somewhere between the poetry and cinema. The fire is the manifestation of one of those possibilities, which without a digital camera would never have been possible. Right now, when I saw the dark section of ABC Africa, at that time I wasn't making video work, but now I am. Right 
at that time, if I was making video art, perhaps I would not have included a four minute dark sequence in the middle of that film. But by choosing to make a four minute video installation, I would have satisfied myself. Did you make any film that had a video In some other way, this was a version of The Taste of Cherry, I think. Why don't you tell the kids about me? After a period of darkness, and of bearing the darkness, then suddenly light and water and life and a tree and signs of life. So this is really a video installation that had imposed itself on the scene. I don't mean to be a walking advertisement for digital art, digital filmmaking, but anything that gives me freedom, anything that removes pressure and opens opportunities, I feel that it's something that gives me the opportunity to make what I want and to do more. Um, yeah, we have time for maybe one, two yeah. questions. Yeah. Uh, very short and quickly. Excuse me, please be quiet and we, we will deal with this question first. In thinking about freedom, uh, I was just curious about um, what you thought about the implications for freedom of expression given the shifting political climate in Iran and the Middle East. This is why um, you might not hear many of the cries. That's why what I'm trying to say is that the freedom of expression is not something that can be a determining factor in the fate. Just as a very personal piece of information that I can convey, believe me, we are allowed to say anything we want in Iran. But it doesn't have any effect. This is what is sorrowful. Uh, yes, there's two more of us. Sorry. Para preguntarle, ¿qué elementos de su cultura dominan a tal vez 
formado en su narrativa y que lo hace tan peculiar de otros editores. Y otra pregunta, ¿qué simbología tiene los años? It's as if 
perhaps looking in common at the same point ahead, there's a moderation that comes upon our discussions with one another. At the same time, it's a room with two chairs, and you put on your seatbelt and carry on talking, and one of you can't storm out into the kitchen or shut the door or leave the location. We've all had these experiences. The happiest and the most painful conversations in a completely closed space. Yes. I hope in the future I can get a permit that says that no one else will ask me this question. <laughs> I can, I can promise not to make any more films in cars, but my two next <laughs> scripts are actually taking place in cars. But after that, I won't. <laughs> 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 just, just that. Sí, lo voy a hacer en español. Mire, uno es: ¿existe entre ustedes el turismo en su país, en su casa? Y la segunda es felicitarlo por la. La, la vista de la filmación en el carro, porque nos puede ver, podemos ver la descripción de lo que sí, del servicio, del de ¿no? Y para no nada de gracias. Muy amable la vez que hizo. Felipe Mandro, ¿no? Andrés, si voy a ser así, no te digo que yo soy la que ya está en la noche, reflexión, y el puto del sol de la vida. Thank you very much, and thank you for bringing up that very essential point in terms of aesthetics about reflection, because this is a moving room which carries in it the reflection of the world itself. Thank you. And now I'm going to the next one. And I think. We've really come to the end because we could probably go on forever, but this has taken up two hours. Uh, thank you very much for coming, all of you. Um, we, we have Sorry to drop that um, answer to your first part of your question. In no way is there any racism in my country. I'm proud to live there, and I have to say that I've always had the opportunity not to live there, and it is not something that I would tolerate, and I'm proud of living in a country where no such thing in any way exists. Um, then I think we can finish because we've taken up two hours um, and I know that people have to go out and see films but I'd like to thank you very much Alice Kiarostani for coming to our show.